If you're new to Cornerstone, I'm Pastor Paul, and I'm one of the elders here, and we are a church that believes that Jesus really meant it when He said, Go make disciples of all the nations. The IMB is the International Mission Board, and every Christmas we have a special offering, an opportunity to give. We call it the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. And uh, this Christmas, December 23rd, on that Sunday or at our Christmas Eve service, you have an opportunity to give to the International Mission Board to support missionaries taking the gospel around the world. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter number 9. Romans chapter number 9, where Paul gives the foundation of our sure and steady hope. I am happy to announce to you that I survived Black Friday. I survived Black Friday. And I want to tell you how I did it. Three words. I stayed home. That's how I survived Black Friday. You see, while all the ungodly people were out shopping, I was at home Putting up my Christmas tree. No, I'm just kidding. You're not ungodly if you shopped on Black Friday. But I still think you need Jesus. No, I I shopped on Black Friday too. I did it Saturday morning online. As a matter of fact, I just read today that online sales on Black Friday were $6.22 billion. And it was up quite a bit from last year. And... uh, Two billion of that was spent on your smartphone. Two billion dollars on Black Friday was spent on smartphones. Now, Monday is known as Cyber Monday. And analysts are predicting that Americans will spend another 7.8 billion dollars on Cyber Monday. Now this reminds me of when I was 16 years old, I worked at Warehouse Groceries, and I never will forget how I hated Tuesday, because every Tuesday, it wasn't Cyber Tuesday, it was Ground Beef Tuesday, and they would put ground beef on sale at Warehouse Grocery every Tuesday for 99 cents a pound, and it was the worst day of my life, it was like Black Tuesday, I I, I would come in after school and I would have to clean the entire meat department. All the while, I would have to keep the meat counter stocked. And every Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday evening, all these redneck women would pile in warehouse groceries and they would buy just dozens and dozens of packages of ground beef and I could never keep up and I remember they would push that little buzzer and I'd be like I'm coming I'm coming and and I'm grinding beef and I'm trying to clean the floor and it was just it was a black Tuesday ground beef Tuesday and I never will forget this one Tuesday I was just about to to finish all the cleanup it was quitting time and I looked out the window over the meat counter And there was a big shaggy dog sitting there. And I thought, good night, what is that dog doing in the grocery store? And so I went out the door and I went around and and I looked and and he had a purse in his mouth. And he put the purse down and and, uh, in front of the meat case. I said, what is it, boy? I said, do you want to buy some meat? He said, woof, woof. And I said, well, hmm. What kind of meat do you want? Do you want to buy some liver or some bacon or some steak? And I said, oh, I know what you want. You want ground beef. He said, woof, woof. I said, well, okay. How much you want? You want a half a pound? You want a pound? You want two pounds? You want three pounds? He said, woof, woof, woof. I said, okay, I'll get you three pounds of ground beef. So I... Went back in there and just, praise the Lord, had three more packages. I went around, I put them in his purse. I scratched around in there and I found $3.18, exactly 
what three pounds of ground beef would cost. So I thought, man, this is, ama- this is an amazing animal. So I went and I ran and I clocked out and I came out the back and I followed that big shaggy dog. And he ran about a three quarters of a mile down the road and he went up a little side street into an apartment complex. And he climbed the stairs and he got up on about the third floor and he went down the hall and I, I'm just kind of creeping along behind him, just kind of trying to stay out of sight. And he went up to a door, an apartment door, and he started clawing on the door. About that time, the door opened and this man came out and started screaming and hollering at the dog and started kicking him. You stupid dog! And kicking him. I, I couldn't help myself. I said, whoa, sir, stop! Wait a minute. This has got to be the most intelligent dog in the world. This is an amazing animal. You should be so thankful. He looked at me. He said, intelligent? Thankful? Well, that stupid dog, he's forgotten his key three different times this week. Well, I want to talk to you this morning about why we should be the most thankful people on the planet. By the way, I want you to know that everything I just told you is true. Except for the part about the dog. Now before we read our text from Romans 9, I want to I wanna read to you a true story from history about a man who lived in a very wicked city. The city was known for its gender confusion, its immorality, sexual perversion, homosexuality. It was also known for its pride, its gluttony, its neglect of the poor. It was a very, very wicked city. The man's name was Lot, and the city's name was Sodom. And these two angels came to see Lot, and I want to read to you the account, historical account, of what happened when these two angels came to Sodom to visit Lot. It says in Genesis 19, verse 1, Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and he bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night. And wash your feet, then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, however, no, but we will spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and and entered his house. He prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, And all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien and already he is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them 
and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. They thought he was joking. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters for the compassion, that's the word mercy, the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you. And do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords! Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please, let me escape there. Is it not small that my life may be saved? He said to them, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the town was called Zoar. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But his wife, from behind him, looked back. And she became a pillar of salt. Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. Thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. The Bible says in Deuteronomy that nothing would ever grow again in the land where Sodom and Gomorrah once stood. Now with that true story in mind, I want us to read our text in Romans 9. We'll pick up in verse 22. We'll pick up in verse 22 and we'll really study beginning in verse 27. What if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And He did so to make known the riches of His glory upon vessels of mercy, which He prepared 
beforehand for glory. Verse 24. Even us, whom He also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. As He says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people. And her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Now look at verse 27. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute His word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom. And would have resembled Gomorrah. Now let's remember the context. Remember in Romans chapter 8. Paul said that Christians have received a spirit of sonship. A spirit of adoption. And we are children of God. And then he says children of God have been given some unbelievable promises. Unshakable hope. And you remember these promises like we know that God causes all things to work together for good to them who are called according to His purpose. To those who love God. Promises like who will bring a charge against God's elect when God is the one who justifies. Promises like we overwhelmingly conquer Through Him who loved us. And promises like, there's no created thing able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But Paul, being Jewish, being a descendant of Abraham, Paul knows what the Jews are thinking. Paul, if your gospel is true, then God's word, God's decree toward the Jews... Has failed. And Paul knows that's what they're thinking. And Paul says, I have great sorrow, unceasing grief in my heart about the lostness of my people, the Israelites. But then in verse 6, Paul says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And in verse 8, He says, that is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise are regarded as descendants. That word sperma, or offspring. And then Paul begins over the next three chapters to explain what does it really mean to be a child of God, a child of the promise. And he he begins to show how it's way more than just being a descendant biologically of Abraham. And we saw through Isaac's birth that being a child of God requires this life-giving power of God. And we saw through the call of Jacob that being a child of God requires a life-giving call of God. And then last week the title of the sermon was Even Us. And we saw that Paul includes Gentiles like most of us, into this beautiful Jewish story of Hosea buying back his unfaithful wife of harlotry. Now, I want to ask you a question. In verse number 24, who is Paul really talking about when he says, even us? Because if we don't get that right, we will completely miss Romans 9 10 and 11. And we'll miss the foundation of our sure and steady hope. Now look back at verse 23. And he did so 
to make known the riches of His glory upon vessels of mercy, which He prepared beforehand for glory, even us. When Paul said even us, he's not referring to Gentiles. That's impossible because Paul used a first person pronoun, us. Paul was not a Gentile. Paul was a Jew. And so he couldn't be talking about the Gentiles. But he also couldn't be talking about the Jews only. Because he, he says it's not the Jews only. So who is Paul talking about when he says even us? Well write this down. When Paul said even us. He was referring to believers, true children of God. Now look at verse number 27. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. And this comes out of Isaiah chapter 10. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. Now let me just. This is a maybe a side note. But I want you to notice here again. Paul is not pulling his theology out of thin air. Paul is. He's, he's not quoting Oprah. He's not quoting Dr. Phil. He's not quoting Sean Hannity. Paul is quoting Isaiah. Paul is getting his doctrine from the Bible. Paul is going to the Word of God for his theology. And so Paul's quotation here is, is actually derived from the Greek Old Testament. It's called the Septuagint. Now here's what I want to do. I want to read right out of Isaiah chapter 10 the quotation that Paul, that Paul quotes. Isaiah 10, 20. Now in that day the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped will never again rely on the one who struck them, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return. The remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. Verse 22, Isaiah 10. For though your people, O Israel, may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. A destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. For a complete destruction, one that is decreed, the Lord God of hosts will execute in the midst of the whole land. Now let me remind you who Isaiah was. Isaiah was an 8th century prophet, 8th century B.C. He was a contemporary of Hosea. We studied him last week. Hosea was prophesying in the north while Isaiah was prophesying to the southern kingdom of Israel, known as Judah. Now remember the names of Hosea's children. Remember? Scattered, unloved, and not mine. <laughs> not my people. Okay, and remember that those names represented what we deserve in our sin. Well, I want you to write this down. Isaiah had a son named Shear Yashub. And, and his name means a remnant shall return. A remnant shall return. Now, don't forget, while Hosea and Isaiah were serving as prophets, the Assyrians came and took over, completely took over Israel in the north. 722 B.C. Both Israel and Judah tried to make alliances with the Assyrians rather than trusting God. And the Assyrians came in and attacked both the north and the south. 
The northern kingdom was fully taken by the Assyrians. It was never really restored. The Assyrians imported Gentile captives from around the world. They interbred with the Jews, and hence we have the birth of the Samaritans. Most of you knew that. The only reason the Assyrians did not fully take Judah to the south was a miracle. It was a complete miracle. An angel of the Lord killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers one night. And God preserved a remnant. And then later on, when the Babylonians came and took Judah into captivity in Babylon... God preserved a remnant and brought them back into the land. Now, here's what I want you to see. Write this down. The remnant that returned from Babylon. They were, the remnant was spared when the Assyrians came. A remnant survived the Babylonian captivity. That remnant was a picture of God's grace preserving the true people of God was a picture of grace. So the names of Hosea's children remind us of what we deserve in our sin. The name of Isaiah's son is a reminder that by God's grace, we've been set apart and preserved as his people. Now, Paul quotes Isaiah 10 to make the point that God's promise to give Abraham a lot of descendants, like a lot of, of, uh, of, of uh, children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so on, that was never a promise that they would all be saved. God's decree was to save a remnant. Church family, nowhere in the Bible does it say all human beings will be saved. I wish it said that. The Bible does say everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But it doesn't say all people will be saved. The Bible doesn't even say most people are going to be saved. I mean, listen to what Jesus said about how many will be saved compared to how many will not be saved. Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Listen, true children of God are a remnant. That word remnant means a small portion saved by grace alone through faith alone. Now look at verse 28, Romans 9, 28. For the Lord will execute His word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. Now this word thoroughly it, it, it means completely or fully. Here's what I want you to remember. Nobody gets away with anything. Think about this. The just full cup of God's wrath for every sin against God is either consumed at Calvary or will be poured out on sinners forever in hell. Did you ever think about that? Every sin that's ever been committed, the wrath of God on that sin is either consumed at Calvary or it's consumed by sinners forever in hell. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 2, 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath. For yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 40. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire. 
so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels and will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Matthew 24, Jesus described hell like being cut up into little pieces. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus described hell like being blind in darkness forever. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus described the wrath of God like being burned and eaten by maggots at the same time. In Revelation 14, 11, it says the smoke of their torment will rise forever. I never will forget about, I don't know, eight or ten years ago, I was at my home in Georgia and a couple of Jehovah Witness ladies pulled up in the driveway and they began to talk to me about their beliefs and about this kingdom and I just began to talk to them a little bit about, you know, about the Bible and I said, ladies, can I, can I ask you something? I said, does... Is it possible for something that does not exist to smoke? And they kind of looked at me for a minute and they said, well, no, I don't think so. And I said, well, now you ladies, you, you, you believe that there is no hell. And you believe that people who are not uh, uh, in the kingdom, the way you understand it, will be annihilated. They'll just simply cease to exist. I said, can you explain to me how is it that these who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ in Revelation 14, 11, the smoke of their torment rises forever. Can you explain to me how somebody who doesn't even exist anymore that has been annihilated can smoke in torment forever? They could not explain that to me. You know what happened? Those ladies never came back to see me again. I pray for them. I pray for them. You say, Pastor Paul, man, this is Thanksgiving. This is Thanksgiving weekend. We don't want to think about hell on Thanksgiving weekend. We're trying to celebrate all the good things that God has done for us. Hello! God has not done no greater thing for you than to suffer the wrath of God, your hell, at Calvary. We have no greater thing to be thankful for the fact that That Jesus consumed the wrath we deserve at the cross. And the fact that we're not going to hell should make Christians the most thankful people on the planet. And Paul says thoroughly, and then he says quickly, without delay. To cause a duration to come to an abrupt end. With the implication of sooner than expected. That's. That's a, that's a Greek lexicon definition of that word. To cause a duration to come to an abrupt end. I was down in Kansas City a couple of weeks ago with Paul, Robert, and Laura. And uh, they have a brand new student center there at the seminary. And so we were kind of enjoying that and nice new bookstore and gym and walking track. And they've got a, a kind of a game room with a bunch of ping pong tables and pool tables and I was playing Laura Pool, and I was talking smack. Man, I, I told her, I said, girl, I said, you're probably not even going to put a single ball in a pocket. And I, and I had knocked one of, one of them. I can't remember if I was stripes or solids. I'd knocked one in, and I was talking smack. And I told her, I said, you know what? I, I might just run the table on you right now. And I got down there and I, to, to hit my second shot in. I don't know why, but look, I'm shooting a gun. Anyway, and I, and I, and I you, know, you know what happened? I knocked the black ball in a pocket. You know what happens if you knock the black ball in a pocket? 
The game comes to an abrupt and sudden end. It was over. And, and, it, and it just came to an end. And it seemed like it was way sooner than expected. In 1 Corinthians 15, 23 and 24, Paul said, Jesus is going to come back and then comes the end. And Peter said, in 1 Peter 4, the end of all things is near. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, His return will be like lightning, like a thief in the night. So be ready. And all these people, they spend all this time and energy studying the signs. I want to say, read your Bible. Jesus said, stop looking for signs. He said, you need to be ready. The fact that Jesus is coming without warning sooner than expected, should make Christians the most intentional, urgent people on the planet. We should be intentional to find persons of peace. We should should feel urgent about getting an urgent message to them. Now look at verse 29. Paul says, And just as Isaiah foretold, Unless the Lord of Sabaoth, that's the Lord of hosts, that's the, that's the Lord of the armies of God. Unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity. That's the word sperma, a seed, an offspring. We would have become like Sodom. And would have resembled Gomorrah. Now Paul is quoting Isaiah chapter 1. In Isaiah 1, 4, God is speaking to rebellious Judah. And he says, Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from Him. Who is that? That's all of us. Listen to verse 9. Isaiah 1. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom. We would be like Gomorrah. Church, The only reason a remnant of Jews survived the Assyrians and the Babylonians was grace. That's the only reason. Remember what we said last week. Sin has made Jews and Gentiles not a people. All Jews, all Gentiles, sin has made us not a people. Sin is what makes Jews and Gentiles unlovable in the presence of God's holiness. But God, in His grace, listen, preserved a remnant of Jews. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 11. I say then, this is verse 1, I say then, God has not rejected His people, has He? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, Paul says. A descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected His people whom He foreknew. Verse 5. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant. According to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace... It is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking, it is not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it. And the rest were hardened. Write this down. The only reason the Jewish remnant was not consumed like Sodom and Gomorrah, was God's grace. That's the only reason. God's grace. 
Now you say, Pastor Paul, you know, that's nice. I appreciate all that history. And, but I'm not a Jew. What's this got to do with me? Well, before you think verse 29 has nothing to do with Gentiles, don't forget this. The only reason you and I are not consumed forever by the wrath of God is that in His grace, God saved a Jewish remnant that led to the birth of Jesus. The one who bought you and me back, fulfilling the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis twenty two eighteen, 18, when he said, In your seed, all nations will be blessed. Now listen to what, don't lose me right here. Listen to what Paul said in Galatians about that seed, that word sperma. Galatians three sixteen. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is Christ. Now listen to what Paul says in Galatians 3.29. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's sperma, offspring, heirs according to promise. Now let me take you back to 924 Romans. The even us is believers. In his grace, God kept his promise to Abraham, providing a savior And a saved people, offspring, those who are in Christ from all nations. Remember what Paul said in Romans 9, 8. It is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as sperma, descendants. So write this down. You and I, we're believers. We are children of the promise made To Abraham, which was fulfilled in Christ, who took Jew and Gentile and made them one in him. Church family, the only reason there will be any people in heaven, regardless of ethnicity, is grace. Were it not for his grace to provide us a savior we would all be like Sodom and Gomorrah, consumed by his wrath. See, here's the big idea today. If the Lord in his mercy had not provided the salvation of his people, nobody would have escaped his righteous fury. Now, You say, Pastor Paul, who are his people? Well, the answer lies in the very next paragraph. We'll study it more next week, but look at verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel... Pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as though it were by works. Notice what it does not say. Paul did not say Israel did not attain righteousness because they were not elect. That's not what he said. It says Israel did not attain righteousness because they did not pursue it by faith. By faith. They would not throw up the white flag of surrender and declare bankruptcy. They wouldn't do it. And they wouldn't say, 
I can't do it. And they wouldn't throw themselves on the mercies of God. And so those who give up trying harder and humbly start trusting in the mercy of God, those are the people of God. Listen, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. To who? Everyone who believes. First the Jew and the Gentile. You know, there were. There's another true story in the Bible in uh, Luke 17 where Jesus was walking along and there were ten lepers who lived in a leper colony. Off, they had to live off, segregated by themselves. And the, the, uh, the history books talk about the stench of rotting flesh that would come from the leper colonies. It was a, it was a terrible disease. And there were these ten lepers. And the Bible says that as Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And there's these ten leprous men who stood at a distance. And they raised their voices and they said, Jesus, have mercy on us. And he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. And listen to this. One of them, only one, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet. And he gave thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? The nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to that one, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. The word well there is not the word used earlier when they were all ten cleansed. The word well there is the word sozo. That's the word saved. Your faith has made you saved. You know, we're wrapping up Thanksgiving week. and I just have to be honest as I've prepared this sermon and as I've been in my quiet time, I've I've been very convicted about my attitude of ingratitude. I've been very convicted about just the spirit of ungratefulness that I feel like prevails in my life far too often. And I was reading in Colossians 3 in my quiet time this week. and I want to just read these three verses. Paul said, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Then he says this, the next verse. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then he said this in verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. And as I read those verses, I was very convicted because it says singing with thankfulness. And I realized I do more groaning with fretfulness than I do Singing with thankfulness. You say, Pastor, what what, what do we have to be thankful for? Let me just give you one thing to be thankful for. When you were dead in your transgressions and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt 
consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross.